Dark Souls is an action role-playing game that was released for consoles in 2011 and subsequently PC in 2012. It is the second entry in what is now known as From Software's Soul series, Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2, and, at least spiritually, the most recent release Bloodborne. If you have never played the game, then I strongly advise that you do not watch this video. Dark Souls, like most forms of entertainment, is best experienced without any prior knowledge to ruin surprises and influence your reaction. Dark Souls was the first game in the series that I played. I had heard some praise for the game online and decided to play it when the PC version was released. I went in completely blind. Since then, I have gone back and played Demon Souls and then Dark Souls 2 when it was released. I have not yet played Bloodborne. I am stating all of this up front to give an idea of how I approach the series and how much of it that I've played. I also want to say that I consider Dark Souls to be one of the best games ever made and that it's high on my list of favorites. That said, it is not a perfect game. It is a flawed masterpiece that has earned a fanatical following. In many respects, it is the previous generation's Ocarina of Time. Not just because both games have similar gameplay and fantasy settings, but because they provoke similar reactions when critiqued. Dark Souls' reputation has become so ingrained in gaming that many of the same statements are made when the game is discussed. Chief among them, however, are the following two. That the game is brutally difficult, and that despite said difficulty, the game is always fair. This last point is usually reinforced with some anecdote concluding with the phrase, I'm dying a lot and it's always my fault. I love it. The purpose of this video is to highlight what I consider to be the game's major issues. I'll probably go into more depth than is really necessary, but I feel like Dark Souls is a game that deserves a thorough examination. I will be focusing on gameplay rather than the story, and a large section of this video is devoted to a walkthrough of the entire game to highlight specific sections that are problematic. The game starts after a few cinematics and we can get moving right away. This is a good introduction as it gets the player in control in very little time and all the cinematics are skippable. We're taught in the first few seconds that lootable items on the floor will glow until you pick them up and that some doors will require keys to open them in order to progress. In the next hallway, we have some enemies that will never attack you, but still take a few hits to kill so you can learn the basics of the controls in a safe environment. There are messages on the floor that are activated in the same way that you pick up items. They state the controls to the player in the event that they are unwilling to experiment on their own. We climb a ladder to the next area and are already shown that the game will involve navigating areas vertically and not just horizontally. There's a bonfire placed in an obvious location in front of a set of large closed doors. If you look up while opening them, you can see the asylum demon perched on top of the building. I have no idea what he's doing up there, but it's a neat detail. If you're quick about getting to the messages on the floor and reading them, you can get to the exit at the back of the room and continue on without dying. If not, you're killed and sent back to the bonfire. You're shown there's no limited lives or anything like that, and are introduced to the death system in the game. From here on, you fight your way around the rest of the asylum, acquiring both equipment and the experience necessary to properly fight. I think it's a great tutorial area, especially because it never wrenches control away from the player. The steel ball on the stairs might feel cheap, but it teaches you to be wary of ambushes and, most importantly, doesn't do enough damage to kill you. My two issues here are nitpicks. The messages on the floor are part of the game itself but look identical to those that players can leave in other areas. This can be confusing to a new player and, if they played the game blind like I did, they might be confused for a while exactly what the game is trying to tell them with the later ones. The other problem is regarding armor and weapons. The game teaches you how to equip your weapon and shield by putting them in a hallway with an archer funneling you toward the pickups. I don't think the game went far enough with this and should have started you naked and made you find and put on your armor too. Equipment load is an incredibly important part of the game and there is a world of difference between being below or above 25% encumbrance. It's instinctual to think that heavy armor will make you move slower, but when you start the game already wearing a set, it's not obvious that your movement speed is already subpar compared to your character's base. Anyway, you carry on and eventually fight the Asylum Demon properly. I personally killed him after plunging by complete accident. I mindlessly spammed attacks and Estus until he died. 
Other players might not be so lucky, but are introduced to one of the core features of Dark Souls, to continue trying to kill the boss, learning new things each time until you finally get it right. You're plopped into what serves as the central location in the game. A text overlay instructs you on how to level up and you're left facing the most important bonfire in Dark Souls. The camera automatically points toward the crestfallen warrior and he gives you some vague instructions that might end up being more confusing than helpful. Fate of the undead, right? Well, you're not the first. There are actually two bells of awakening. One's up above in the undead church. The other is far Far below, in the ruins at the base of Blight Town. Ring them both, and something happened. Brilliant, right? Unless you pick the master key as your starting gift, you have to get really close to ringing the first bell of awakening before you can unlock the way to the second one. Giving the player the location of both at once makes it sound like you have a choice between the two, and that heading far, far below is just as valid as going up above to the undead church. This is a minor point, and ultimately, I don't think exploring all of the different paths branching out from Firelink Shrine is a bad thing. It makes the world feel massive and gets the player curious about where each of the different routes lead. I've read horror stories of players spending a lot of time trying to get through the cemetery first. Eventually, people find the right path. The first battle is an interesting jump in difficulty from what came before. You're taught not to overextend and deal with each hollow individually. You're encouraged to learn them back out of range of the firebombs being thrown, which incidentally gets them away from the other hollows that might join the fight too. There's a hollow with a shield to reinforce what you learned in the asylum about parrying, backstabs, and guard blocks. I actually found this first group to be pretty challenging on my first playthrough. I think it's easy to forget how difficult Undead Bird can be your first time. Maybe you'll die a few times, or maybe you'll get through the first few groups on your first try, but eventually you'll reach the next bonfire and complete the first of many relays that are in the game. Dark Souls doesn't have missions or traditional levels like in some other games. Every place is connected in some way by internal logic within the game, whether that's by an elevator, crossing a bridge, or being dragged through the air by gargoyles. You're let loose into the world and are free to find the limits of where you can go on your own. The equivalent of levels, then, comes from each large area of the game being organically split into smaller chunks by the bonfire system. These fires are spaced throughout the world and serve as checkpoints for the player. The paths between each of these bonfires become levels of sorts. There are obstacles and enemies that you need to overcome in order to reach the next bonfire and progress through each area in the game. Using this bonfire will likely be the first time that you see that enemies respawn when you rest and not just when you die. Again, this aligns nicely with the idea of bonfires being tied to a sort of level that you can reset by resting. I have a lot to say about Undead Burk throughout this video, however not all of it will be relevant at the moment, so let's continue on. The area around the bonfire is close enough to hollows that they will engage you when you leave the room. This, coupled with the hollows throwing firebombs from the balcony above and the three undead in the room across the bridge, teach you that rushing forward is rarely a successful method of proceeding. It is much safer to kill the undead near the bonfire and make sure that nothing is following you before running over the bridge and continuing onward. You're being introduced to packs of enemies now that cannot be singled out like the first group in Firelink Shrine. Finding multiple enemies at once changes the combat in Dark Souls significantly and is something I will talk about later. For now, know that these packs are challenging but reasonable. Every hit you make interrupts their attacks and they have low health. They move slowly and it teaches the player caution. There is an optional mini-boss in the form of the Black Knight shortly before the climb to the Taurus Demon. This guy was incredibly intimidating on my first playthrough, but I wanted to kill him. I spent a lot of time throwing myself at his shield until I finally learned how to duel. I think I even figured out how to make the bonfire give me 10 Estus charges just so I could kill him, and even then, I did so barely. I got the Black Knight shield from him. I think this is a great optional challenge for players who either want to improve or are better than average when they start it. In some respects, Taurus Demon is the real first boss. It's a strange choice then since the best and almost certainly intended way to kill him is the repeat of the Asylum Demon. It's testing your ability to remember the plunging attack. The boss doesn't spawn immediately and when you run forward you are shot in the back by two crossbow hollows. This doesn't kill you and, although it may feel a little cheap, I think they're both there to help the player rather than hinder. They make you turn around and discover the ladder before the Taurus Demon even spawns. You climb, kill them both, and now you have the vantage point to launch your plunging attacks. I say this is a strange choice because the game never really requires you to do the plunging attack ever again after this. It's reinforcing something that the game itself promptly forgets about. I killed this boss by plunging onto him and frantically trying to climb the ladder again. If you take too long after reaching the top, he can jump up and continue the fight up there. I think that's a pretty cool detail. 
There's a calm victory jog through the ramparts after this boss. You go down some stairs and cross a giant bridge and are immediately killed by a dragon. This is the first of many gotcha moments in the game that I think are completely indefensible. They're a large part of the flawed in the flawed masterpiece. That doesn't stop people from trying to justify them like some weird victim complex though. The most common argument that I read is that the small scorch mark on the bridge should be a huge warning to the player, as if the existence of fire sometime in the past should mean fire in the future, and that fire in the future means a dragon is going to fly overhead and murder you. If the game repeated this sort of logic throughout all of the airs, then maybe this argument would hold some water, but it doesn't. This is probably the worst gotcha of them all. It sours your recent victory, and there's a fair chance that you won't be able to make it back to your bloodstain in order to recover the huge reward of souls that you just got from Taurus Demon. It also runs the risk of erroneously telling the player that this bridge is uncrossable and that you should be looking somewhere else to proceed. There are a lot of unexplored paths in the game at this point. Honestly, I really am dumbfounded that this encounter made it to the final release of the game. Halfway across the bridge are stairs leading to what I think is one of the greatest moments in Dark Souls. The level design in most games is usually so poor and incoherent that I've come to expect things not to make sense. This moment that Undead Berg loops back into itself and reuses the bonfire is genius. It's one of the three moments in the game that actually made me pause and admire how the world suddenly clicked into place. I went from wondering where I was going to knowing exactly where I was. The other two moments are opening the door in the aqueduct after Capra Demon and the floodgate in Mulando. I went through Valley of Drakes early in my playthrough and had those giant doors in the back of my head for many hours, wondering what the hell the game was still hiding behind them. When I finally drained New Londo and looked out to see the Drakes, I started laughing and couldn't believe how stupid I had been. The dimensions made perfect sense that, of course, that's where the doors led, but again, I was so used to poor level design that it never even occurred to me that I could have thought it through to work out where the doors open. Rewarding exploration with these sort of connections inside and between levels is, in my opinion, the best thing that the game does. Firelink Shrine in a way becomes a larger meta bonfire that serves as a checkpoint that links all the larger locations in the game. You're going around opening all these paths that loop into each other while you're lighting all of these bonfires. Aside from its bullshit introduction, the Hellkite Dragon is an interesting enemy. It can be used to your advantage to easily farm souls by poking out on the bridge and having him kill all the hollows for you. You can also shoot off its tail for a powerful early game weapon, although I believe the intended way to get it is this. You have a choice from here to go under the bridge or get by the dragon by luring it down and dashing past. This leads to another bonfire and a brief shortcut to get into Undead Parish without having to constantly go through the bridge hollows and rat room. Another black knight at the top of the tower is the second optional challenge for this area. It's a bit cheap to put him so close to the stairs and I'm sure many players climb up and get immediately smacked before they understand what just happened. I was not able to kill this guy right away on my first playthrough. I had to come back after killing the bell gargoyles. You might not know that you can run through here quickly enough to get to the next area before the hollow pulls the lever to close the gate. If you fight through instead, the area teaches you to use cover to hide from the range hollows and to lure the most dangerous enemy, the bull boar, to a safer position to fight. This enemy always felt buggy to me. You can butt stab him, but that's very inconsistent. I feel like the intention was to get to the bridge and then plunge attack onto him, but he's usually too far to reach and requires an awkward running jump. I've only ever managed to pull it off once. Also, there are other ways to kill him. Continuing on, part of the floor has crumbled on the way to the church and has been replaced with wooden supports. This is a part of the game that I mentioned earlier. If the developers wanted you to read the environment for warnings like the black smears on the bridge, then the wood here should be a hazard. There's even an alternative path through the church that you could take, but you can cross here without a problem because reading the environment for massive leaps in logic is not something the game expects you to be doing. Exploring around the church will inevitably lead the player to the blacksmith, the elevators back to Firelink, and the heavy knight. This entire area is set up precisely to teach the player how important it is to upgrade your gear, your weapons most of all. 
The blacksmith is right below the bonfire and impossible to miss. The sound of him constantly striking his hammer is louder than the metallic hum of the bonfire itself. There's a firekeeper soul here and the heavy knight always drops a titanite shard, so you have the currency to use on a weapon without having to risk souls buying one. The balder knights also have a reasonable chance to drop more shards. It's no accident then that the boss of this area is a damage check of sorts. Many of the systems in Dark Souls can be described using borrowed terminology from massively multiplayer games. There's corpse running, which is when you die and have to make it back to your body to retrieve your things. There's aggro, which is when an enemy has noticed your presence and is now being aggressive toward you. There's pulling, which is the act of engaging an enemy from afar so that it comes to you alone instead of with a larger group. The term that can be applied to the gargoyles then is a DPS check, damage per second. More plainly, it's a test to see if your character is doing enough damage to proceed in the game. The gargoyles are not the most difficult boss in Dark Souls, but I do firmly believe that there is no greater difficulty spike than them. Make a new game and then try fighting them without upgrading any of your weapons if you don't believe me. The idea here is sound, it's an organic way of teaching you that upgrading your weapons is important. You fight to the boss, get him down to half health, and then the second gargoyle descends and you're overwhelmed. Increasing your damage is the best solution, to kill the first gargoyle before the second one comes down, or at the very least damage it so much that you only have to sneak in one or three attacks after the second one drops. The problem, however, is one of the largest ones that the game has. The combat system becomes absolutely awful when you have to fight more than one enemy at once. Let me explain. Combat in the game initially feels slow. There's a methodical pace to it that many players, including myself, found alienating when they first played. There's a delay to all attacks you make, although delay might not be the correct word. The controls are responsive, but there's a deliberate wind-up that is meant to make you think more carefully about your actions. The same holds true for enemies in the game. They have to commit to their attacks in the same manner that you do. Fighting enemies usually involves a mixture of defensive and offensive tactics. Hold your shield up to block or roll away, and then counter when your opponent is exposed from the attack that they just failed to land. Enemies can, and will, use the same method on you, and so striking first always has a risk. You can kick through enemy shields to create openings for yourself. You can wield your weapons with one or two hands and strike with both light and strong attacks. You can use your shield to parry enemies and then counter for massive damage, or you can strafe around your opponent and stab them in the back for similar bonus damage. It's noteworthy that the game's combat never adds any new mechanics. Although I have left out some nuances in the interest of saving time, the combat system I just described is that way right from the start and all the way to the end. It is surprising then that it remains gratifying even after several playthroughs. Even saying it now, it doesn't sound particularly engaging. It lacks the combo system that other action games utilize or ultra flashy special moves, or more complicated movesets that has the player switching between dozens of different attacks while they tear through waves of enemies. But it's exactly the slow pace that makes the game so compelling. Damage from enemies is so high that mistakes are heavily punished, meaning that decisions made in combat have real weight to them. Fighting through a series of enemies and timing everything perfectly, knowing how it all works so you can get through an entire area without taking a lick of damage, is immensely satisfying and addicting. One on one, you can see all the information that you need in order to make decisions in combat. You might still make a mistake, but it was your mistake to make. The moment that number becomes two on one, you start butting heads with a plethora of problems. With more than one opponent, incoming attacks can layer over each other in unpredictable ways. You may successfully dodge the first attack but get caught in the second one during the exact same roll because there was no correct time to roll at all. Holding your shield up faces the same problem, a barrage of attacks that layer over themselves so that there is no real opening for a counterattack. Even worse is if the attacks happen so fast that you end up losing all of your endurance. Luring multiple enemies into a narrow corridor should be a useful tactic to combat this, but it isn't because enemies in Dark Souls can attack through each other without any issue. This is most easily seen with projectiles that can bewilderingly fly through in any enemy model and right into you. The same goes for melee attacks, spells, fire breath, anything. You can all be cramped in a line in a corridor and both of them will be able to hit you. Enemies also have an additional advantage in that their attacks don't bounce off walls like yours do. It makes sense that you can't swing a sword through a wall, but it doesn't make sense that the monsters you're fighting can. It's one of the most frustrating features in the game and is also full of inconsistencies. Sometimes groups of enemies are okay. Undead Berg, as I mentioned earlier, gets away with it because the hollows are so weak. Every hit you land staggers them, and it only takes a few to kill them. The horde before gargoyles works in a similar way. They're so fragile that you can manage them without getting swarmed. More powerful enemies need to be dealt with differently. Luring them away to attack separately is usually the best, albeit time-consuming, method. But you can't always do that. 
and you definitely can't do it with bosses. The Bell Gargoyles really are awful to fight by yourself if you don't get a chance to rush down the first one. Attacks from their spears are large and sweeping and can easily overlap. The fire is the same way. Sometimes one will be channeling its fire while the other is swinging its spear from around you so you have limited options to avoid them and zero options for attacking until the fire is over. It's here that the game's combat changes for the worse. The Estus Flask, one of the key items in the game, is an outstanding game mechanic. The limited charges that refresh for free upon resting at a bonfire encourage you to use them but also not to waste them. There are decisions to make during and after combat. Do you risk healing in the middle of a fight? If you win a battle and you're only a little damaged, is it worth it to top up your health even though part of the Estus Flask will be wasted? For new players, the flask is a limit on how far they can explore before they need to think about turning back to the bonfire to try again, or to risk pushing on to see if they can make it farther. The flask running out of charges is the reason that the sight of a new bonfire can be such a relief. When you're forced to fight multiples like the gargoyles, the flask ceases to be a resource to correct mistakes and instead becomes the amount of times that you can go on the offensive. With attacks layered over each other, you either need to wait prolonged periods of time to finally attack, or you risk running in for a hit and then run out to heal before doing it all again. This boss fight is necessary in order to teach the player about the importance of weapon damage. I just feel that it's a shitty way to teach an important lesson. A single gargoyle that has a mini phase like Artorias' buildup could have been better, a short amount of time that requires you to do sufficient damage in order to prevent the gargoyle from healing to full. A light damage aura could have also accomplished this. At this stage in the game, the amount of Estus charges you can have is limited. Requiring a certain amount of DPS before running out of charges would have accomplished the same goal without throwing two bosses at a player. An additional problem is how this fight can be handled by different builds. Like many fights in the game, it's trivial for a spellcaster. Being able to attack from range solves the problem of the later attacks. It makes a lot of the game easier actually, and that's something we'll get into later. Finally, the drop you get from the Black Knight in Undead Bird can also remove this teaching lesson from the player. I mentioned before that I got the shield, and I don't think it should be underestimated just how appealing it is to use whatever item you get from him. I immediately leveled my character in order to be able to use that shield because I was so proud that I killed him. I would have been even more excited to use a weapon if the sword had dropped. The footage that has been playing uninterrupted for a while now is how it looks to do this fight without using any upgrades. For the sake of comparison, here's how different it is when it's a plus 5 longsword instead of a base one. Here's the Black Knight Sword. Lastly, here's what a caster build looks like. I want to stress that this character hasn't used any upgrades either, and should be compared to the first example rather than the previous two. Eventually, you'll kill the gargoyles. You have your victory climb up the church tower and you ring the first bell of awakening.